Hello and welcome to this anti-racism forum hosted by UFV RAN. My name is Aaron Levy, uh, CIBL. Aaron, I'm sorry, there's mm -hmm. still, I'm so sorry, attendees are still coming in. Yeah, okay. There, maybe give them like a minute, sorry. Sure, yeah. Sorry, no, Aaron. That's what I was, yeah. <laughs> I can just see the numbers going up, so mm -hmm. yeah. So we'll wait for people to come in. Thanks everybody Thanks for joining <laughs> us. Okay, I think you're good to start, Aaron. Numbers are kind of slowing down, maybe. Okay. Hi, everybody. We're just waiting. We've just been waiting for a couple minutes for people to uh, kind of trickle in. We have an agenda that we'll present uh, in a moment. And I guess, yeah, we'll, I'll briefly meander over to uh, opening things up, and then we'll get to our panelists. So hello and welcome uh, to this anti-racism forum hosted by UFV RAN. Uh, my name is Aaron Levy. I'm CIVL station manager at UFV, uh, the campus community radio station. I'm a member of RAN and I will be reading aloud uh, question and answers today, uh, question and answer questions today for our panelists uh, who you see here in the cascade of windows in the gallery view. If you select, you should be able to see everybody. Uh, before this panel begins, we would like to acknowledge first the ancestral, unceded, and traditional territory of the Stalo people on whose land we reside on, of course, uh, where we're situated, where our city stands, and where UFV stands on. Um, and we acknowledge that as we're all gathered here under the call and charge from the Black Lives Matter movement and in solidarity against police brutality and institutional oppression, suppression, suppression and negation, uh, that where in the past two months, police and or law enforcement officers in Canada have killed at least five Indigenous people, Aisha Hudson, Jason Collins, Stuart Kevin Andrews, Everett Patrick, and Chantal Moore. And most recently, there was an RCMP shooting of an Inuit man in Clyde River. In the highly suspicious circumstances and police involved death of Rigi Kushinsky Paquette and the ongoing ruptures in state silence and inaction for the murdered and missing Indigenous women. And as our co-chair Sharn Sandra, who we'll hear from, said uh, when she opened Rand's panel last Thursday that had, uh, I understand, uh, over 200 people participating, uh, RAN recognizes the need for more Indigenous voices and, partici and participation both at UFV and within anti-racist network groups in general. Uh, and we're committed to continuing to support that work and engage those partners and foster and create those new and existing spaces that reflect our will and our collective abilities to unpack and address the colonial roots of this land and this institution. And so we raise our hands to Indigenous defenders who continue to fight and protest the expansion of pipelines on their lands. Uh, and we see our power, we see our resistance, and we see you and acknowledge our roles uh, as settlers to these lands as well. So our panelists today are, are co-founders of RAN, Drs. Adrian Chan and Satwinder Carbanes, uh, as well as our current RAN co-chair, uh, Sharn Sandra, from the South Asian Studies Institute and the UFB History Department. Uh, gracefully, uh, we are grateful for uh, Professors Dr. Ghislaine uh, Larzawi and Dr. Rita Take, who will be, they're gonna be reviewing and prioritizing uh, your questions. So your questions for our panelists that you make in the chat, you can use the chat function here in Zoom to pose questions 
that will be kept anonymous and uh, the professors will be providing one question at a time for me to pose to the panelists and uh, that will be the question and answer portion. So use that chat function uh, to pose your questions and our moderators will uh, assist us and, and thank you for doing so. Uh, so the, if you, I guess if you do have other questions, you can pose them in the chat and if we need, we can address them as we, as we go on. So for the agenda today, uh, Dr. Chan and Dr. Baines will be speaking first, uh, then Sharn will be sharing evidence of racism at UFV, uh, and then we will be following that with your questions as opposed to Dr. Baines and Dr. Chan, uh, and the, semi uh, the seminar today will end with a call to action and some next steps as well. So, so we'll be taking notes, um, actions will be tracked and shared through the RAND network and its platforms. There's a Facebook group if you'd like to join if you're a student or staff member. Um, uh, and if you're white like me, we ask, or we, we, you know, I, I, I would I would suggest that that if you do become a member, uh, that that you try to respect the space and provide space and make sure that we keep space for people who are not. Um, so if your question is not answered aloud here, it is being recorded and noted, uh, and when we can continue that discussion uh, and those discussions on our other platforms and, and through participation in the group. So while you listen for the next half hour to our panelists, uh, remember they work in the UFB community and against racism everywhere. Uh, they do not, though, represent decision-making bodies here. Um, this is why we will focus on actions uh, to take out of this event and why we ask you to pose the questions uh, that keep our panelists in mind. So feel free to ask difficult questions. That's what we're here for. Uh, and rest assured, people, we are, people are listening. We are listening. We are here for a change. And you engaging uh, helps us accomplish that. So uh, without further uh, preamble um, to our panel. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge that we're on the unceded territory of the Solo people, and we're grateful to be able to live and work on the territory. Um, I also want to mention uh, that this session is being recorded, if you didn't note that already. Um, and so um, that's why only uh, those of us on the screen are, are, are going to be speaking. And um, as Aaron said, I'm one of the co-founders of RAN, and also I'm on faculty in the School of Social Work at UFB. And I've been at UFB for 16 years now. RAN uh, began its discussions with a, with a group that met after a March 21st event uh, in 2006. And we were a discussion group for about four years. And then we moved into becoming a little bit more formal and RAN became named uh, just over 10 years ago. And we were mainly a faculty and staff group, although we had the participation of a couple of deans and we continue to have the representation of a few uh, deans at the table from time to time. And uh, that has been important to us, um, but not the sole purpose. I mean, we are there no matter who is at the table. And we've had students, staff, uh, and faculty uh, attend our meetings for like over 10 years. RAN really began to gather momentum when we organized a PD day in 2010, for those of you that were here in 2010. Um, and we had a very good turnout, over 100 people, and was one of the first PD days that had that, that kind of high number. Um, that uh, PD Day was supported uh, by administration and we had many workshops uh, that really tried to get at the heart of racism and understanding racism, but looking at what we need to do next. So here we are 10 years later. In 2011, we produced a report and that report is on our website. And yet there is still a lot of work to do. In that report, we talked about a number of things. These are all issues that are still ongoing. Indigenization is one of them. And of course we have made some strides in indigenization, but there's more work to do. We talked about supporting international students, supporting anti-racism initiatives for students broadly. We talked about collecting data on anti-racism and there is no real documentation that we know of that's formalized in terms of collecting data. 
We also recommended looking at the hiring, tenure and promotion process, hiring for diversity, hiring for diverse racialized populations. And, you know, we talked very importantly about raising awareness and engaging the university wide in raising that awareness and institutionalizing a sense of anti-racism that we need to address that as a university-wide strategy. The recommendations that we made in the 2011 report still hold today. There's still much work to be done. And you'll see that if you look at the report. Racism continues to exist in the world, but at UFE. And we cannot deny that racism exists, but we must move forward to address this. We have people that will deny racism, but it's there. And it's there and occurring with our students, with our staff, with our faculty, with people on campus. And racism can be overt or it can be covert. It can be subtle. This is harmful to us and for students. It makes them fearful, afraid to speak, and sometimes they don't know who to turn to. This is a difficulty of transparency in our organization. People do not know who to go to. And sometimes they come to us at RAN because they don't know. So we cannot continue with denials of racism. And we can't continue to say, we are trying. That's not good enough. People are being hurt. But we must talk about racism. And if you're afraid to talk about racism, then let's engage in a discussion. And maybe it's because you don't have the words or maybe you never really thought about it, but it's time to think about it and it's time to talk about it. Maybe it's because you believe we are not a racist society, but we do live in a racist society as we've seen in everyday occurrences, in the news, in the blogs, on Facebook, it's everywhere. So it's time to examine your role our role in addressing racism. For some people, this means examining their privilege in perpetuating racism. By breaking the silence, the title of our talk today, we are saying the silence must stop. The silence, when it occurs, condones and colludes with racism. By keeping quiet, there's a denial of racism and that has to stop. Every one of us has to speak out and call out racism. RAN is a group that is calling out racism, but all of us have to do that and be able to do that without fear of reprisal from people around us. And reprisal, whether that's because people have uh, given power or assumed power over us. Another element of silence is about silencing others. This must be examined. What power any of us have if you've ever silenced someone. Just think about that. One of the ways to stop the silencing is to examine the power that we use to silence others. We know we do that in our lives. We do that with our kids. We do that with our neighbors. So we know that that does exist. So I'm asking you to think about the way that you may have silenced other people and the way you take that privilege to silence other people. We can no longer collude with the silencing. RAN is taking up space to say there can be no more silencing of racism and the harm that racism inflicts. Whether it's overt or covert, 
unintentional or intentional. We must act to stop the silencing and stop the harm. We want to build an anti-racist and inclusive community at UFE. And so I am asking you to commit to being an anti-racist today. And think about what it means to be an anti-racist. In the book, So You Want to Talk About Race, Ojioma Oluo says, anti-racism is the commitment to fight racism wherever you find it, including in yourself. And it's the only way forward. And Ibram Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, says, an anti-racist is someone who's expressing the idea that racial groups are equal and that we support policy that reduces racial inequality. So for us to be anti-racist, we must understand how we are influenced by systemic racism before we take action. We have to examine our role, how we have internalized racism, what happens when we act or don't act when we see racism. At the heart of it, we have to examine our own racism and challenge those racist ideas. None of us is immune from this. We must look at the problem of power, the problem of curriculum, the problem of policy, the problem of inequality. The system is something that needs to be changed and we have to put our energy into that change by being anti-racist. To be clear, it's action that lies at the heart of anti-racism. And so this is a call to action. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Uh, Dr. Baines, if you wanna. Thank you, Adrian. Um, I also wanna speak really about why we're here today and to break the silence against willful and damaging systemic racism here at UFV that's been going on for far too long. So we accept that racism is real, it does not need to be defined, and that silence is betrayal. But first, I'd like to honor June as Pride Month. I'd like to acknowledge our settler position and culpability in displacing indigenous lives. I'd like to hold space for the palpable grief in our society from police brutality, from racial terror and violence. I want to honor the rage within us against the ongoing injustices. I'd like to recognize the inequitable, inequitable response to the global pandemic and the vile and uncalled for racism that has been targeting our communities. And as part of RAN, I stand side, and side by side with my colleagues with Black Lives Matters global anti-racist revolution by recommitting ourselves to anti-racism work at UFE through this position. I'd like to give currency to the emotional labor that BIPOC peoples are constantly undertaking to fight racism, to end injustices and to make a better society. This is a labor that is never paid. It is overburdened and called upon into service by those in power when it suits them and is undervalued and ignored as a construct for change. Today, if you are not angry, you have not been paying attention. The dominant center of power that dehumanizes us is currently being decentered all over the world. And we are gathered here also to hold our university to account on that decentering. Globally, the time for constant placation is over. At RAN, we're in a path to move onward, forward, towards actually doing something tangible for the long-term change at UFE. Our question is, how can a knowledge sector such as ours stand neutrally by when it clearly mirrors the racial and gender hierarchy of our society? While our UFE community has been decimated through enforced isolation through COVID, BLM has triggered a collective voice that is unstoppable, unapologetic, unap it's a force that's driving us towards a call to action, as Adrian has said, and nothing less. 
asking for a dismantling of systemic power and privilege. The system isn't racist and broken. It is racist and working perfectly. Like the current UBC board chair who liked, who liked a number of, not one or two, far alt-right comments comparing BLM to Hitler's parliamentary wing, and he liked the support for Trump's response to Antifa as a terrorist organization. And upon being asked just yesterday, he said he was unfamiliar that his Twitter account was a public one that no one, that anyone could see his tweets he liked. This from a law professor of 24 years. We are astonished at the sheer arrogance of it all. When people in power can catch or do one thing, do another, and expect silent license to keep on doing it. But I can tell you, not anymore. While one might say we don't see white hooded lynching types of racism at our universities, that the aggressions on our campus are slight and not accounted for, we are here to tell you that death by a thousand cuts is still death. Having no higher authority to go to where you might see yourself reflected stops you in your tracks. As a regionally responsible university, we need better representation of BIPOC in the halls of power. Anti-racism calls, calls out systems where white power, white privilege, white complicity, white fragility, white hegemony, and white supremacy thrive. So in order to critically examine and name these singularly racialized positions that hinder growth and willfully support only each other's positions, we must look at ourselves, just as Adrian has said, deeply and with great care. At RAND, we are not seeking reform at UFE. We are seeking structural change. Reform's time has come and gone. And we know there are many amongst us who resist any kind of reform. Why do we have Black History Month, Sikh History Month, Days to Remember Cultural Genocides, Indigenous Days? Because every month, every day is White Colonial History Month. Every day is designed with colonial mindsets, entrenched and embedded forms of structural racism that prevent real room for anything else. But we must make room for that. We are asking for racial literacy and a commitment to anti-racism as key competencies for professors both current and new hires. We cannot allow them anymore to say they don't know how to deal with race and racism in the classroom. We want the teaching at UFB to reflect the classroom demographics, both in its curriculum and, its, and in its value commitment to being relevant. We recommend every student who comes to UFB learns to be an anti-racist in every class, in the same way we ask them in our ILOs to become critical thinkers, to be analytical and imaginative, to be good citizens and leaders. We can do this. We will have a BIPOC caucus at UFE to create a safe, safe space to speak about our experiences and seek redress. We have a goal to build alliances and accomplices with like-minded individuals and groups that will strengthen our position at UFE for ourselves and collectively. We hope to develop an anti-racist research and policy center with a goal to address and amplify the real and entrenched structural and systemic inequities within UFB and any external impacts. Sustainable support is needed for this work from UFB. One-time funding gets us nowhere and is an example of tokenized application. We recommend an equity office at UFB that is independent of human resources. International's corporate agenda bypasses and ignores the real and difficult difficult experiences of our international students. As hosts, we have talked about how we have failed them in our UFE-wide inadequate responses. We will define what it means to be an anti-racist ally and accomplice, and we invite you to learn and be part of that journey. We recommend a full UFE-wide equity and anti-racism action systems review yearly in order to provide the UFE community with a report card. The days of only celebrating our diversity are marred by the real injustices we as BIPOC persons experience on a daily basis. Those who don't experience racism will not know the damage it does. As BIPOC, we may be stunned with disbelief that it's actually happening. Then we are disgusted that it really is. And then we are disappointed that it continues. Then we find a commitment within us to work against it and use activism as a tool for real change. Too often diversity is confused with real action. 
It is not the celebration of diversity we are against. It is a tokenism in that celebration and the co condescension of attitudes. Do not demand too much, to stay in our place, to not make too much noise, to watch the decorum, etc., etc. It is as if Chinese food in the cafeteria provides for belonging. We ask those of you listening, if not now, when? If not us, then who? If not this, then what? Angela Davis said, in a racist society, it is not enough to be non-racist. We have to be anti-racist. And as Adrian has given out the clarion call for all of us to join and become anti-racist, there is really no more time to talk or live in regret for that which has not happened. The time has come for a call to action for the work ahead, and that time is now. Thank you. Okay. I'm here today to share what UFE students, staff, and faculty have shared with me over the past two weeks in particular about their experiences of racism at UFV. As a reminder, those UFE departments who are mentioned in these very real stories and anecdotes are being named because unless we name them, and call them out, nothing will change and we cannot move forward. I acknowledge the tremendous bravery of the indigenous black people of color who have come forward with their stories. This is re-triggering of the traumas of their experience in the very space of learning and growth of education that is supposed to harness challenge, harness change, intelligence, humanity, human struggles and thought. I'm proud to say that UFE students through the RAND Facebook page platform have openly called out the statements put forth by UFE leaders. They are questioning the validity of work to be done. They are questioning how indigenizing the institution will be considered. And they are questioning purposeful action. I applaud these students for being bold to critique and question, for that is the very purpose of why they are here and why we teach and harness these learners. I begin with students and staff who have shared their experiences at Student Life. We already know that Student Life is devoid of any permanent staff who are indigenous, black, or people of color. This is the department that serves our students, and we all know the incredible diversity of our students. BIPOC students working in student life have told about their experiences of emotional abuse, negligence, dismissal, and when they approached leadership about these systemic issues, they were told to keep quiet or else fear losing their positions within the department. Staff members have also told me about a complete disregard in this department for ethical hiring and promotions, where white staff are hired in positions they are ill-equipped to be working in, and people of color are not granted the same opportunities, and in case they are hired, they are eventually pushed away because of the inherent racism within the department. These are their experiences, they are not imagined, they are real, and they need to be addressed now. I have been told that the only BIPOC people in certain departments, when they speak out against abuse of international students, are subsequently pushed away ostracized and ignored amongst their all white fellow faculty members. This is the same for when BIPOC faculty bring about any issues around equity, hiring, and deeper philosophical issues around social justice and racialization. When hiring permanent faculty positions, UFE departments will continue to hire underqualified white academics over qualified BIPOC. There have been stories shared to RAND members over a number of years where this has happened in many different departments. Another issue raised was the interviewing process within the teacher education department where a visible BIPOC potential candidate was not accepted into the program. This person shared their concerns about a complete lack of diversity within UFE's teaching program who end up becoming the same educators in the elementary, middle and high school systems. I have been told that the white Christian Mennonite Abbotsford community's power in particular trickles down into UFE, which has a very clear similarly framed power and privileging of the same groups whether through hiring a staff, hiring a faculty, or granting opportunities to students. I have been told in previous years, the HR Auxiliary Hire Coordinator absolutely refused to hire BIPOC or harness growth and opportunity with the very small handful of BIPOC Auxiliary who even worked at UFV. The subjectivity of this position within HR is a problematic one because this person single-handedly has the power to position certain auxiliary across campus offer growth, offer potential, and offer permanency. The majority of this has been done for white former auxiliary 
who have now consistently gained permanent status across various departments at UFB. I, as a member of RAN and a UFB sessional faculty, can speak to the abuse, neglect, and dismissal of international students, many of whom are from India. When Baker House residents were given a few days to evacuate with the COVID breakout, RAN leaders at the time asked for clarity and answers, only to be told we were spreading rumors. The trope of making BIPOC people the crazy ones is a common one. And we have evidence from students crying to faculty, panicking with email evidence that the message was to evacuate immediately. With RAN's advocacy among many others advocating the same, this messaging was changed and reversed. This is but one example. While teaching last year and during an icebreaker exercise, a young lady, an international student from India, stood up from her own volition in my class and began crying, telling me in the whole class that for the first time since her schooling began, she felt human. She felt her experience, her being away from her family, all by herself was finally acknowledged. The whole class of various backgrounds rallied behind her, leading to one of the most amazing classroom experiences I've ever had to date. We take their money, and yet we have dehumanized them at this institute. Many staff, faculty, and students have come forward expressing how UFE has become corporatized through this very process. Their money is gold for UFE, but not the color of their skin. They are still pariahs in our midst. Speaking of students, we asked for anonymous experiences of their racism at UFE, which I will now share. I cannot share them all that we have because we don't have the time, but I want you to know if you are listening that we will be taking all of these stories into account and we'll, we will be working to enact change. According to one student, quote, my first incident of racism was during my first year of study. I registered as a BA student with a chosen major of English but during the second semester, I encountered a professor who took the liberty of embarrassing me in class and belittling my experience as a speaker of English. When I consulted her privately for an advice on how I could improve my grade, she told me to take ESL classes. As a result of this experience, it drove me to have severe anxiety and depression. Not only did I have to change my major because I was scared to even see her at campus, I also had to start taking medication. This professor's actions drove me to have a nervous breakdown. Since this initial experience, I've encountered three more professors that were dismissive and condescending. End quote. I want this student to know that we hear you at RAN and we are not going to let this slide as we know it's not just you who's experienced this, it is many, 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 many others. We will be pursuing this. Another student shared a story saying, quote, with summer courses going on, there hasn't been a strong enough act of support for those students being affected by what is going on in the world right now. It doesn't seem as though professors or counselors have been guided on how to best support their students. As such, students, and in particular BIPOC students, are having to go through the pressure of maintaining good work in their courses. I only know of two BIPOC counselors at UFB, one of which has left her full-time position to counsel every so often. Both counselors were excellent. However, it's an issue that UFE has a majority of white counselors, especially when there's a large amount of international and BIPOC students who need counseling services. I have had students tell me that as the only single BIPOC student in a room full of visible white students, they are constantly put in position to defend themselves, their communities, their belief systems as it relates to acknowledging a position other than through white centeredness, which is draining emotionally, but continues to undermine their lived experiences as a form of knowledge. Once again, in some of these situations, it is the faculty member who is ill-equipped to handle these situations and their silence ends up harming the student. UFE's Alumni Association is another area with systemic issues as they neglect to harness their BIPOC alumni and when approached to do anything related to diversity, equity, and challenging conversations, leaders within their department have conveniently not showed up to any of these events held last year. Your dismissal and lack of attendance at these important events are noticed by many, I assure you. The entire team at University Relations must stop highlighting human connectivity stories about white people only. For example, with the most recent, your social media coverage of Mother's Day and Father's Day. This is one example as a part of a consistent pattern. Believe it or not, there are UFE staff and faculty who are fathers and Black and Indigenous people of color. Believe it or not, there are mothers at UFE and who are Black, Indigenous people of color. 
By relegating coverage of Indigenous or Black or people of color based on stories that box us into our specific cultural categories and when you're only there for an Indigenous ceremony only, your entire department is dehumanizing us. Please stop treating these social media sound bites like they're a part of a high school clique. I am sick and tired of seeing the same people highlighted on your social media channels and being given platforms of privilege and power. Look beyond your own selves, please. There's an entire heartbeat of UFB that you have absolutely no sense of. I've been told that there have been complaints of systemic racism within the athletics department at UFB towards BIPOC students and staff in the athletics department that has been under unaddressed for several years, despite both high profile and under the radar media coverage. And finally, we need to recognize the systemic issues in which in its entire history, UFB has had only two leaders in the admin who were visibly people of color that we can recall. If we are wrong about this number, we apologize, though I don't imagine it will make a deep impact on the larger white impact of whiteness within admin history at UFB. Let that sit with you as you ponder what the ramifications of this means in terms of the philosophy of learning and growth. I want to also say that every leader at UFB in a position of power was personally emailed encouraging them to attend this session. RAN will be following up with all of them and making public through its accountability register who chooses to change and who doesn't. It's that simple, folks. This is where we're at. Either you show up to the table to change or you're part of the systemic problem. Satwinder and Adrian will be speaking more about actionable items to close this session. There is no department at the university that is exempt from critique. There is no department exempt from specific individuals who perpetuate stereotyping, erasure, deflection, dismissal, or try to uphold systemic racist values. Your students are watching, your students are waiting for change. With that, I'll turn to Aaron to start reading out the questions. Thanks everybody for sharing your feelings, your thoughts, your, your perspectives. And uh, it's, it, this is difficult for, uh, for everybody involved. So we're gonna look at um, the questions. We have at least five or six right now and more are still coming in. The first one is uh, a, a challenging one. Um, and it focuses on uh, kind of we're organizing these so that uh, you know we're dealing with bigger picture items up uh, up front and things will trickle down from there I imagine. Uh, but what can be done to engage uh, the the question? The first question is how can uh, the president's office actively actively but not just performatively engage with RAN? That is the first question for our panelists. Maybe start Adrian and I'll pick up. Well, the president's office is certainly aware of RAN and um, both Seth Winder and I um, actually sit on the equity, diversity and inclusion task force of the president. Um, you know, we can't answer for the president, um, but uh, we can try to have further conversations with the president uh, in the past. Um, uh, the RAN co-chairs um, before Sharn, uh, Ghislaine and Melissa uh, did meet with, with uh, the president uh, in, in uh, early years of, of her term. So, you know, it's, it's a difficult question. Uh, people are aware of RAN and the importance of RAN at this university now. Um, I think we've we've gained traction over the last year or so. Um, and that is really due to the work of the network and people who have really committed to, to uh, meeting with the president and with senior admin. I think, you know, we have to keep trying and, and um, you know, on another level, I think that the president is, is willing to listen. I believe that, that she is there for us and she's, she's noticed us. So that's an important beginning step. And, uh, you know, the previous president was like that too. Mark was uh, engaged with us to a certain degree. Um, but presidents are busy. So there's often a delegation down to what that means. Pass it on to Seth Winder. I agree with everything you said, uh, Adrian, and I agree with you that uh, Joanne is open to listening to us. But I guess where I would take it as a recommendation from Rand would be to have, you know, quarterly meetings with her. We would ask for that. So it's an action plan to say, you know, meet with us four times a year, uh, not with your delegate, but with us, with members of Rand, and hear from us um, where there are challenges and barriers to affect change. 
as a leader, uh, we can only go to her if we want to see a trickle down effect through all the departments and divisions. And um, I think the opening is there. Uh, as Ran has discussed, uh, we hope to have an action plan laid out on pe with pen and paper on ink so that people can see it and, uh, and take note from it. And this is one of the things we would recommend. Uh, I agree, Adrian, that you know, Joanne can't be everywhere, uh, but I think there are lots of really good opportunities for us to um, affect change through her leadership. Um, I don't want co uh, Rand to be co-opted by anyone. This is a network of people, their energies, their minds, their thoughts, their passions, their tears. Uh, this is not something people can own. This is a network, and unless you are part of that network, you cannot co-opt us. Uh, so I think uh, I think Joanne's ability to be at meetings is probably uh, too much to ask, but I think there's other ways. So thank you for the question. I think it gives us that opening to take it one step further. Thank you. Um, to the second question um, from our from our. Uh, chat is how does UFV ensure that their professors are continuously exposed to anti-racist sessions, workshops, forums, etc. And I think, yeah, uh, this is a conglomerate of a number of different questions. Some of them focused on what to do about uh, microaggressions, different things that people have talked about already. But um, uh, yeah, re reflecting uh, to all staff anti-racism sessions, workshops, forums, how does UFB ensure that all professors are, are engaged with that? You know, that, uh, Aaron, there's always the conversation at UFB, what can be mandatory and what is voluntary. Like we have a union, right? We have to be aware that people are free to make choices. But I think when something like this uh, is, is affects the health of our institution, affects our reputation, affects uh, long-term reputation when students leave us, um, that there has to be some recognition. We have to sit around a table and talk to the deans and talk to the union and talk to HR and look for competencies. I've said that in my talk that we need competencies just as much as we need other competencies. This is another competency. And people have to have it or they have to gain it. And it is hard when you have such a large faculty number to get everybody to be trained. Uh, and I did take some online training, but you know, it, it's not enough. Like, it's not real. It's not in your face. It's not where you see a human interaction, where you learn through uh, people's stories. You learn that this is real. And I think that's what's missing. I think people are in their little ivory tower. Sorry, this is, you know, the words we use for our, our, our knowledge industry. And people think they're, they're either not affected or they're immune. And so breaking down that, uh, those barriers, those silos, it's not, RAN cannot do this alone. RAN has to have collaborators, partners, allies, accomplices for different tasks. And I think for us, as Adrian has mentioned, there's more clarity. There's a clarion call from us. Like there's more clarity in terms of next steps. You know, not that we haven't had next steps in the past, but this is different. Thanks, Atwinder. Um, I think we have to think about the core values of the institution and the people that we hire in this institution. If we don't get at that, then you can do all the training in the world and people will not be practicing anti-racism. And so to examine core values, you have to have everyone engaged in that conversation. Deans, department heads, you know, senior admin and so on. Um, if, you, if you have a training that's just targeted, targeted to faculty, it doesn't work. Because when that faculty leaves that training, they can just say, well, I have my academic freedom, or I have this, or I have that. You've got to have the people around that faculty member, those faculty members, understanding what their power is, what their privilege is, and what they need to unlearn as they have engaged in racism, whether overtly or inadvertently. 
So values is a key part of what training needs to do. And, you know, at UFV, it's, it's hard to instill certain kinds of values that are kind of more neutral. You know, we have tried to instill the value of learning outcomes. And that was not, uh, you know, readily accepted by everyone. Well, you shift that to something more difficult to talk about, like racism. You can see how that is a bigger matter. I'm not saying we shouldn't engage in this. We absolutely have to. But we have to engage with the people around uh, the faculty and the staff and the, you know, the department heads and all the people so that they can get into that value sense so that they can, as I've talked about, engage in citizenship. Because to be a good citizen, really, to me, is to practice anti-racism. Thank you. Um, the, so I'm gonna, the, oh yeah, our, uh, so we're getting some responses to some of these questions that I know our panelists uh, that our panelists aren't, aren't necessarily looking at right now. And I'm, I'm going to see if I can uh, add that into some of these other questions uh, to kind of bring some conversations full circle. But this next one, I think, is a very focused and, and, um, and uh, an immediate question that needs answering. When racism occurs in the classroom, who do students turn to? How can students of color ensure that their grades and treatment in the classroom are not effective, and I know it's something we've talked about at RAN as being um, problematic in that the answer is not clear enough. What 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 does exist? What needs to exist? And maybe to add on and to go back to that first question is what is the president's office's role in ensuring that these things are happening going forward? That there are mechanisms in place. You'd be amazed, uh, Aaron, how many students I empower all the time to go to their deans. They actually don't think they have a voice. They don't think they can go to a dean. They can go higher up. They can go to a head. They're afraid of repercussions. They are real, not imagined. And so how do you create a safe space in a classroom, right? How do you hold a professor accountable for their actions? This is a lopsided question. The power is all on one side. So unless we dismantle that power where there are vehicles for students to go and ask someone for redress and they have advocates who help them, who will go with them. It's something for Rand to think about, right? Like it's, I know sometimes you have, I know all the time you have to have both sides of the story. You have to know what the, what the situation was, all that, but the advocacy is so missing. And I think students are just, I feel like students are here for four years and waiting for their time to leave if they have issues and don't actually get any redress. So I think the vehicle is required for them to get redress, but the, the positionality is so skewed that to, it won't just happen. There has to be systems put in place for that to be undone. And better, more robust systems put into students do feel they can go to a dean or a department head. I know the deans and department heads don't close their doors. They're not saying that. But I don't think they've made any kind of inroads into the student population to say, my door is open, come see me. You know, it's a little bit, we're too busy, we're doing meetings, we're making excuses for all that. That our constituents are our students. There is nothing more dear to us than our students, both in terms of currency and in terms of our public uh, human relations. But also so. something there, the positionality is skewed in terms of students who hold systems of power behind them and end up saying things that are explicitly racist in the classroom. The positionality is skewed when students say things, when students do things on Blackboard threads that those students who are being harmed physically by the racist comments or the racist diatribe don't know how to respond or don't know who to go to. So it's even skewed that there's an empowerment and an emboldenment that the white kids, frankly, feel like they can be racist in the classroom. And that happens. And I haven't even told you half the stories yet. So there's that positionality as well. 
Yes, a few years ago, we had a, a talk about that at the Prodi Day, and a couple of professors in the classroom said, I don't know how to deal with racism in the classroom. I have no idea. I don't touch it. I act like it isn't happening. I move away. I just like, I'm blind to it. There's a real failure of the process here. There's a failure of communication of what any process can be. And we have all failed at that. A student should know when they come on campus what their rights are and who they can go to. There's a lack of transparency around that. And if a professor, a faculty member, doesn't know what to do, well, they're accountable for what goes on in the classroom. And they need to be held accountable for that. So first of all, today, among the over 100 people that are in our session, how many people know who to go to if there's a racist incident, either in the classroom or on campus? How many people actually know who to go to? I would say there's not a huge number that knows what that process is, what that line is. And so if, if us in this group and don't know, then how can our students know that? And I know there are students also participating today. So that process needs to be clearly articulated and also clearly articulated to faculty who are responsible for holding that space to be safe. And we know what you said, Setwinder, that happens over and over again. And that is colluding with racism. So we need to have a clear articulation of that process and a communication about that process to students, to faculty, so that they know what to do and who to go to. And I think the process can't be so long and drawn out that you're exhausted by the end of it, that you give up. And that's part of the system, right? That doesn't allow for quick resolution. It's everything is dragged out and drawn out and policy for this and policy for that. And the human humanity of it is lost. And so people, like I said, I have students who have said, I'm just not going to go there. I'm just going to leave when I'm done. But I can tell you that student is not our greatest ambassador at the end of the day. And their experience at UFE is marred by this and they carry it with them. And that's not what we want. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we may not have time for more than one or one and a half more questions and some, some wrap up. But um, so this one uh, is an issue uh, that, that focuses on intersectionality. Uh, how can UFV uh, improve its treatment of BIPOC who are members of the LGBTQI plus community. Uh, but do you have concrete examples or suggestions for activism on this issue is where the question goes. And I'll, I'll ask and extrapolate a little bit if we can, you know, think of how to apply that to other elements as well, because it, it is an intersectional issue, of course. I think the work for RAN in the next six months is to actually develop a plan to build co uh, collective um, insights into each other's needs and to find that alliance with each other and that collaboration. I think we must do that. I think there's a lot of us suffering and we are suffering in silence and alone. And I think if we can see that there is relationships that we've built collectively and for ourselves, even the university will benefit and not just that, we become a power of our own. We have collective power through that process. So I think this, and, and divided we fall, right? Like united, we, we are stronger. So I think one of the things RAN has to do is in the next six months is to, and we've talked about this in the past, it's nothing new, that we need to build stronger alliances. And I think unfortunately, part of our jobs and our work is so overwhelming that we don't have time to do that. So I think for our mental state, we have to find time and the university has to give us that time to be able to do that. I think it's important, as that Winder said, we need to look for allies and build from there. We need to build capacity for the intersectionality and we have to think about who can be our allies in this, in this particular way. And sometimes it's not obvious, because there are other networks that we can be connecting with to have that intersectionality. And, and you know, Indigenous Affairs, for instance, I mean, two-spirited people among Aboriginal students and others. Um, we, we need to, 
engage in that. And when I say we, I mean the collective we, not just yes. RAM. Yes. Um, and, and that's the way forward. Because none of us is any one thing. I'm not just a Chinese person. I'm not just a woman. You know, it's, it's I'm many things. And so we also have to recognize that in ourselves to understand intersectionality and engage in that in a, in a more positive, proactive way. Thank you. I think we do have time for one more question, at least here. And I think it's a good way to kind of wrap up the question and answer. Thank you for everybody who's provided their questions. Uh, thank you to everybody who's followed up and left comments here. I'm getting a couple comments. I think there's one important to read um, that uh, I neglected to take a moment for. If we can take a moment to thank, Sharn read us the accounts of all of the members of our community who, who needed somebody to read the accounts for them. Uh, in in a, in a in a in a forum like this, and I think that there was a lot of uh, and and our colleagues and our and our friends here are recognizing that it took a lot of uh, emotional effort and strength on her part. So thanks, thank you, Sean, for for doing so. Um, and and then for our, for uh, for our last question here, uh, uh, was RAN meaningfully included in the development of the UFE strategic plan? Uh, and can they run a session at the faculty orientations or make recommendations for speakers? And I think this is a broader, longer term suggestion. What engagement can take place with RAN going forward? So Twinder, you mentioned the, the quarterly meetings with, with the president's office. And I mean, I guess this is a question of, yeah, what kind of engagement can we concrete in, in not a performative way, I think is what this is looking at, see going forward as our actions to wrap up the conversation. Oh, lots to think about here. Adrian? Um, I'm not sure I got all the parts, but let me talk about the strategic plan. Um, uh, EDI, uh, uh, Satwinder and I are on equity, diversity, inclusion. That whole group was, was consulted uh, in terms of the strategic plan, and there was a consultation session last week. It wasn't, quote, specific to RAN, but um, if you like, we were invited partly because we're part of EDI, but also because of RAN. Um, you know, to be honest, we didn't really talk about issues of race at, mm. at that session. We did talk about community inclusion and, and uh, ensuring that voices are heard. And we did talk about um, uh, Indigenous communities. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a complicated process, the way the strategic plan is, is out, outlined and with the number of consultations. Um, I think the second part was about orientation. Um, and, you know, I think we could play a bigger role, but um, the other thing is that RAND can't do everything. We need to disseminate our role. And so um, people who are involved in orientation, uh, you know, counselors, student life, HR, et cetera, et cetera, those people should be like, if you like, ambassadors for RAND so that, that um, the RAND goal, mission is heard at that orientation stage. And also keeping in mind that orientation at the beginning of a semester is, there's a lot of information to take in. So it also has to occur later um, for faculty and students and staff. And um, this is also something we need to engage a conversation uh, with the union about, you know, how to, how to be more um, robust in that ongoing kind of discussion. And, um, RAN has uh, uh, had uh, the FSA, if you like, represented at RAN, and we continue to have that, and it's good to be able to have that kind of discussion. So, um, well, the, I think the question was about orientation, but it's more than that. It's about the long term. It's about when, when students and faculty and staff have their reviews, whatever their reviews are, when they move to the next level. With faculty, they, you know, they're reviewed every three years after their uh, probationary period is over. So we need an ongoing kind of thought about that kind of orientation. Yeah, I agree with you, Adrian. Thank you. I mean, so Twin, did you wanna? I, I just wanna close by thanking Adrian and Sharon for being vulnerable on an open stage where we don't know who's watching us and um, to really put ourselves out there because this is a cause worth fighting for. This is a cause where we are 
not beholden to anyone but to our own convictions. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to come through. And I want to say the RAND committee, like Jusslan, Rita, others, Kamal, others who who are the greatest supporters of all of us. There's only two faces or three, four faces you see here, but this is not the sum of our efforts. The sum of our efforts is a larger group that has so much energy and so gives us so much energy to do more. So this is not a solitary kind of exercise. This is very much a UFE wide interdisciplinary student, staff, faculty involved process that I want to give thanks to everybody for doing that. And I think what, we want to do is build an action plan for RAM that we can share with our colleagues at UFE with a goal to change what is happening at UFE to make it a better place. I, I'd also like to thank everyone who, who participated in, in helping organize this, especially the technical part. We were having a few sweaty moments this morning about the technicalities. Um, but I, I really want to close with when you leave today, I want you to think about who you're going to talk about, to talk with about racism. Talk to someone about anti-racism. You know, don't just leave it here. Think about it and talk to the people you care about. And think about how much more you can share and how you can commit to take action and to be an anti-racist. I raise my hands to you, all my relations. And I would add to Adrian's comment by saying, if you can do that, please ask the person you report to, to also talk to you about racism and have that conversation. If it is safe for you to do that, please do that. And if it isn't safe for you to do that, it needs to be. And that mm -hmm. is not something for you to struggle with silently. If in your workplace, it is not safe for you to have this conversation, you can come to this group and there are other people in your community and your family's community who will help you decide the way that institutions have become to start acknowledging they have to address scenarios like that. And that is what I think is, is yeah, that, that's one thing we can all do is call it, keep calling it out. And it's also not the status quo. Like we're not leaving this as the status quo. We are working to enact change. So if the people around you are not supportive, that's a systemic issue that we are trying to dismantle. And so I don't think we should be shy away from being bold and saying that. And that's onwards and upwards for us as we grow at UFE. Thanks very much to everybody. Thank you, and, everybody. Uh, and and yeah, visit that the RAN pages and and the website and uh, and get engaged because everybody here wants that, this conversation to continue and for stuff to to move forward. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Aaron, for moderating. And if I can add something, oh very yes, oh yes, Gislen. Uh, to all of you that posted the question, uh, we really know how much courage it took you to post those questions. So people. Please just be um, aware of that we are compiling all the questions, putting them together, and this is definitely going to inform future actions from, uh, from RAN. Thank you all. We still live. <laughs> yes, I think we are. <laughs> we still alive. We are still alive. <laughs> We're still alive. <laughs> Gentel, can you? Uh, is, is there a way to moderate us off live now, or do we all get cut off? What we do? Just need to wait. Yeah. Figuring that out. No. <laughs> Lots of great feedback from the comments here from uh, basically every level of engagement at the university, going through my Rolodex in my head, yeah. Uh, Sharn, can you address uh, Chris Leach's question? I just did. I just sent him the